Hi, I'm Seth Horowitz. Um, we'll find out who everyone else is in a moment. Welcome to Philly Net Tuesday. Um, I'll go through just a, a little bit of stuff here in the beginning, and we're going to have a, 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 pretty, um, a pretty crowded uh, uh, agenda, so we'll get right to that very quickly. Um, how many people have been to a Net Tuesday before? So it's a majority. Okay, great. Um, this is, uh, we'll, we'll go through this, as I said, pretty quickly. So there are net squared groups around the world, um, and more coming along all the time. They actually differ in a lot of ways, and, there, and there's a fairly loose affiliation among them. The theme that kind of holds uh, us together has been uh, using the social web for social change, as broadly defined as that is. The main thing we do are these Net Tuesdays, which is the first Tuesday of every month. We just passed our four-year anniversary, and uh, we'll continue to do that uh, as long as there's an interest and there seems to be an interest. We also have a website at phillynetsquare.org. The person who's been the webmaster of that website, Ivan, who's been the, uh, uh, the, the co-organizer of Philly Net Squared, is actually moving to Oregon. So there's a job opening for a um, volunteer, mm -hmm. low-pressure, not really much to do webmaster. Um, if anyone is interested, let me know. And we also have a Google group, ListServ, that um, is used by people for making announcements, asking questions, uh, doing stuff like that. This is um, a list of the last year's worth of uh, Net Tuesdays. I won't go through it in any detail, um, but you can see a couple of recurring themes in there. One of the recurring themes is the crowdsourcing change format in which we um, gather two or three local nonprofits who share their website and their social media strategy, and then the crowd, which is you, um, give them feedback, advice, perspective, and stuff like that. Uh, we did that just last month, and um, we're actually going to be doing it again in September. Uh, coming up next week, we normally do a planning meeting the week after our Net Tuesday, so everyone is invited to that. Anyone is invited, and um, I promise you won't get stuck with all the dirty work if you come and just want to contribute some ideas. That would be welcome. We do have our um, July theme lined up, which will be gamification for nonprofits, uh, because games, uh, social games, are actually becoming more important, more widely used in a lot of areas, including for nonprofit advocacy and awareness. Uh, note that that will be on July 10th, which is actually the second Tuesday of the month because of the proximity of the first one to the uh, holiday, the July 4th holiday. Um, we haven't quite settled on August yet, and as I mentioned, September will do crowdsourcing change again. In addition to the uh, Tuesday events and the, the learnings that happen from the Net Tuesdays, we really encourage people to network and to get to know one another. We're trying to create a couple of mechanisms for doing that. One is the sign-in sheet there, um, as Mary is so um, nicely holding up there. And if you can sign in and leave a, a legible name and email address, I'll actually redistribute that out to other people. There's also business cards uh, out to the rest of us, not anyone else. There's also business card uh, collection there. And again, I'll scan those um, into a, um, a PDF and redistribute that out to the other attendees so you can basically have everyone's business cards if you like. People are encouraged to use a tag tag to tag themselves with some information. In addition to your name, in this case, we have a theme that was given to us because of the timely transit of Venus, which um, if we have a break, we'll try and get a quick peek at um, um, on the, uh, the a stream of that. And um, another aspect of our networking is that we have a no questions too stupid policy, which is strictly enforced, and we encourage people to test the limits of that. A little bit of housekeeping real quickly. There's food over there. Please eat it. Uh, we don't want to take anything home. Uh, the Friends Center here is a Platinum LEED certified building. We do have a kind of industrial strength composting service. So all of the uh, food, the meats, cheeses, anything like that can go into the compost, as well as the cups. Uh, the bathrooms are outside right past the uh, elevators. We have Wi-Fi access if you're interested in it. It's, uh, the network is called AFSC Network, AFSC Wi-Fi, and it's just open. We are video recording this event um, and streaming it out to the world. If um, you're concerned about that, 
Um, if you sit in that corner over there, not, not to make you sit in a corner, but it happens to be in that corner, is the video free zone, and we'll make sure that we uh, avoid trying to get you on video for that. The other aspect of this is that we'll be using microphones, even though the room is fairly small and you can fairly well hear each other, um, the panelists will be using these mics, and we have a wireless mic here that we're encouraging use for audience members, so it comes out better on the stream and in the recording uh, with that kind of uh, amplification. If you parked across the street on 15th, uh, across 15th Street, get your card uh, validated uh, at the front desk, and I think it's a $10 charge then, which is less than it would otherwise be. And if anyone is interested in coming out for a drink and a bite afterwards, many of us do that and continue the conversation in a more informal way. Here's what we're going to be doing tonight. We'll do a quick go-around introductions. We're going to have a, uh, a, a panel, uh, panel presentations by our three uh, guests, and we'll uh, go through that in a moment, and a quick Q&A after that. And the, uh, the, this, the workshop section, which I had to put quotes around because I'm not quite sure what constitutes a workshop, but what we'll be doing is a couple of things. The first part will be um, uh, 20 minutes, the telling your story, in which we invite people, invite you all, to talk about how this kind of digital storytelling might be applied in your own situations and how it could be useful, and we'll try and focus attention on those situations. So if you are thinking about um, trying to tell a story yourself, in a digital mode, we can probably help you think about that and how that could be effective. If you are thinking about using digital stories with your organization or your community, we can help you strategize about the, um, uh, the way in which that might be approached and some uh, tools, tricks, and other experiences, not only from the panelists but from the rest of the people in the room that might be helpful in that. Um, or um, during that period, if you have a particular uh, short uh, video of a, uh, a digital story that you want to uh, show and get some feedback on or, or you think illustrates some points, we'll have the opportunity we can actually show some of those during that period as well. That'll be about 20 minutes uh, for the telling your story. The um, so-called editing your story, at that point, um, Azim will be uh, demonstrating uh, using iMovie how a, some raw footage gets turned into a more finished product and we'll see that as it happens. And then during the sharing your story section, uh, Ryan will be talking and demonstrating about uploading some um, video and, and the strategies for doing that, and, and you'll be able to see that, that, that process along the way. Then we'll wrap up um, and finish here, and as I said, if anyone wants to go out afterwards, they're more than welcome to join us. Our sponsor tonight is the American Friends Service Committee, which is one of the uh, tenants of this building. The AFSC does peace and social justice work around the world and um, wanted to promote this as well. And I think that's um, about it that we're going to do as far as introductory remarks. Um, what I'd like to do is encourage people to um, introduce themselves using the mic and just to uh, say who you are and, and if, you, um, if you would like to also mention um, uh, if, uh, any affiliation you have and any experience or questions you have about the digital storytelling process or the digital part of it or the storytelling part of it or anything like that. Oh, those awesome cookies were from uh, Just Cookies, which is owned by Jason Mercado back there. And uh, that comes out of the, uh, the kitchen here in the Friends Center. So people are um, invited to partake of those and enjoy them and enjoy them in the future as well. Um, okay, I'm going to pass this around. We'll start over here. So can you introduce yourself and say, do you want No, you can just stay there. Just put, point, point it at your mouth, please. I'm Rita Varley. I've been the yearly meeting librarian for about 30 years, and now I'm a volunteer in the library. And I'm here because I'm interested in the uh, digital storytelling we had thought of um, doing a series for monthly meetings, and uh, we didn't have enough volunteers then, but we may in the future. So, Thank you. Hi, all. This is Andy Sharp, the Communications Director at the Delaware Valley Association of Rail Passengers, and I'm here because I'm always here. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, John James, and I'm exploring the uh, possibility of uh, online financial accounts that can reproduce, like have children accounts and grandchildren.
inherit uh, settings and services, and that's at uh, replicounts.org. My name is Francis Ellen, and I'm here um, because of Interfaith Working Group of Occupy. We're working on some interview things. I'm Mitch Collier, uh, involved with health communications and other interesting things like that. Hi, I'm Drew Mester. I do uh, cyber insurance, and some of my uh, clients were asking me to learn more about uh, this subject and how it, how it relates to cyber liability. I'm Brianna Morgan. I'm here from the confusingly named Office of HIV Planning, which is a health planning organization. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I've been explaining that one for five years. Um, and I am here because we're trying to find ways to engage more community members. Hi, everybody. My name is Brian Mercer. I'm with the Media Mobilizing Project, and I'm excited to see what other people are doing in this field. Hi, I'm Nina. I work for the Urban Nutrition Initiative, and I'm a nutrition educator. I have a bunch of youth that might be interested in starting a food podcast. I'm Christy Duncan Tesmer from Philadelphia Yearly Meeting, where I'm a senior administrator. And I'm here because we're exploring ways, as Rita was talking about earlier, about um, helping people uh, tell their spiritual journeys and, and sharing those stories. Hi, I'm Lucy Duncan. I work for AFSC, um, and I'm here because I've done a lot of storytelling offline, um, that kind of storytelling learning, and interested in learning how to use um, digital storytelling. Hi, I'm Tony Horiza. I also work for the American Friends Service Committee and do some uh, digital storytelling and other work with video for AFSC. Hi, I'm Susie Subways. I do. I work on the Prison Health News, and um, I'm working on an oral history project, and um, I make videos for Occupy Philly Media. Hi, I'm Mark Lyons. I'm from the Philadelphia Storytelling Project, and I work with youth and immigrants, especially undocumented immigrants, uh, to help them tell their stories and have a voice in the larger world. My name's Laura Jackson. Uh, I'm a member of the Earthquaker Action Team, and... Uh, I used to be a documentary producer, but that was a long time ago, and I need to learn the new technology. Hi, everyone. Doug Barg. Uh, I'm here to find out more about digital storytelling um, in the service of a project I'm working on that kind of at the intersection between education and food. Hi, Mark Revez. Um, yeah, I've been finding in my professional life and also I think to help potentially nonprofits that Stories are simply the most compelling way to um, reach people. There, there's nothing that matches it. And I mean, one, I even read an article recently or a blog post by an anesthesiologist who one of her, the things she doesn't like about electronic health records is it no long, it doesn't capture her patient's story as well. So that was even in a strange place. I'm Stuart Snyder. I'm about to drive a dead man from Philadelphia to San Diego, and I'm looking for ways to tell that story. I can't beat that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm hopefully I'm not the dead man. Uh, I'm Mark Snyder. Uh, my company's called Creative Intelligence. I've been a writer and a creative director and have been telling stories, some good, some bad, for uh, over 20 years, and uh, I'm here to meet the new community, and maybe collaborate. I'm Bill Harrington. I have a website called moneyspentwell.org, where I try to encourage people to invest in social enterprises in developing countries. And I'm here to learn more about social media so I don't, so I don't spend 40 hours a week doing, doing only social media. My name is Lamar Kendrick, and I'm here because I'm interested in building communities online and off. I'm Faye Anderson, and I'm interested in telling the story of voter ID in a way that it will help move the needle on public opinion. My name is Ron King, and I'm involved in uh, <clears throat> fundraising for, for nonprofits uh, through cause-based marketing of uh, energy. And finally, I have a couple of stories worth telling, and I uh, hope to get some clues on how to do that. My name's Jane Reimold. I'm at Temple University, and I'm always interested in what the topic is here. 
Hello, my name is Victor, and I'm an alcoholic. I'm sorry, wrong meeting. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Hi, Vic. Hey. Uh, uh, no, I'm, uh, I've been doing activism for the last eight years, uh, crisscrossing North America, promoting an ethical uh, plant-based diet. Hi, I'm Jim Worcester. Uh, I volunteer for a lot of projects, but the one I'm excited about tonight is Patch Adams Free Clinic of Philadelphia. We just got a five-acre plot of land in the Tioga section, and we're going to build the largest earthship and clinic anywhere. Wow. And I want to document it. Hi, my name is Marcia McInnes, and I volunteer for a number of educational nonprofits, and I'm interested in tonight's presentation for uh, many reasons. Hi, my name is Judah First. Um, I used to be a regular here. I've since moved to New York, but happened to uh, be back here today. Um, I work at a digital agency called Blue State Digital, and have a we have a large portfolio of nonprofit clients, and I'm generally interested in how uh, people can use technology to uh, affect change. Hi, my name is Sharon Rice, and I'm part of the community outreach team for the uh, for Generosity, and I'm just here to help to find out what's going on in Philadelphia and how to help connect the nonprofits that are on our site to all these wonderful services. Hi, I'm Mo. I'm also from Generosity. Uh, I work with community outreach as well as in as well as web development. Um, we cre help create tools to help nonprofits run better um, with regard to uh, volunteers and fundraising. Um, and Seth graciously allowed me to do a quick promo. Um, we do monthly meetups to help people get in the doors of nonprofits to understand them better and to get involved with them and get engaged with them. Um, so we do meetups on usually the second or third Wednesday. Um, the next one is on June 10th. We're doing um, the Tech Mobile uh, cars for the Free Lab of Philadelphia. So if you want to learn more about um, the traveling hotspots that they have going around, um, then you should definitely come. It's at the Free Library 630 at the Free Library. Hi, I'm Mary. I work with uh, adolescents, and I thought I'd take 13 Moody to maybe 13 digital storytellers. Hi, my name is Andrew Sather. I work at Jenkins Law Library, and I'm here because I'm here. As, I'm I come to these as often as I can. And today, I will be monitoring Twitter traffic for everyone. So, if you are tweeting, if you use the hashtag uh, #phlnet2, I will see it and I will retweet it. Um, only if you're interesting, of course. But <laughs> the hardest part of the introductions, I got to get the camera on me. He did it. I am uh, Steve Lubetkin, known as Podcast Steve on Twitter. Um, my firm produces documentary style digital storytelling content for um, for profit companies, non profit companies, trade associations, and anybody else who has uh, the check to write. Yeah, I'm, I'm Michael Schweisheimer, and I'm late. Uh, but I'm also with Primitive World Productions. I do video production with nonprofit organizations. And uh, I went to school with Azeem, so I'm looking forward to this. Hey. <laughs> okay, thank you all. Uh, two things I forgot to mention. Um, Andrew uh, spoke about one of them, which is that we are um, supporting a, a, a Twitter chat um, so that the stream is going out there and people who are out there, which we know at least Ivan is, um, I don't know if we know anyone else is out there. Andrew, do we? Okay, well, ask. Um, if, if any of them have advice or questions, they will uh, tweet in their um, uh, comment or question, and Andrew will speak it for them. The words are coming. I can feel it. Okay, great. Well, we've been doing this for many months, and we get sometimes we get some usage, and it's interesting. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that it is a very informal setup here. So please feel free to get up in the middle of um, presentations to um, uh, go get some food or something. We deliberately left a lot of space along the back so you can um, traverse the room without interrupting people and um, just continue that, that spirit of um, informality. So um, our, our panel tonight um, has uh, Azim Siddiqui and Mike Feagans and Ryan Draving. And I'm going to actually let them introduce themselves a little bit as they go forward. And um, during this panel presentation, they'll have about 12 minutes 
where they'll talk about digital storytelling from their perspective before we get into the other, um, the other stuff tonight. And we're going to be starting with uh, Mike Feagans. Should I switch over? Uh, yeah, please. Okay. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Mike Feagans. Uh, I started Filler Stories. And uh, I'm up here probably because I've been coming to these meetings for quite a while also. And eventually, you'll be asked by Seth to be up here also. <laughs> Um, so I just start out by talking about um, a little bit about why I started doing this, and I, I guess it goes back to growing up in West Philly and, and listening to other people tell stories and having us tell stories to one another about what we did last week, last month, whatever. And you move forward a little bit, and I, I can remember working in the uh, census in 1980, and I was in a neighborhood in West Philadelphia. It was an Italian neighborhood, uh, what I thought was an Italian neighborhood, and I was invited in this apartment by this little Jewish lady and uh, sat down and I stayed there for about an hour, hour and a half and she told me stories about coming from Russia to the United States and I was sitting there thinking, God, somebody should record this. This is really interesting and, and kind of heartwarming as well, you know. And then later I was working in development at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and I was doing my first tour of the hospital with the uh, director of development along, alongside to see how I did and when we were finished, uh, he said, oh, the, it, the tour was okay. He said, but Mike, you need to be able to tell better stories. And that kind of clicked with me, you know, being able to uh, explain uh, pretty complicated material to people so that they could understand it and do it by telling stories. Um, so move forward to 1990, and I started uh, Phil Stories because I wanted to um, have a place where uh, regular people could tell their stories and because I like talking to people basically, um, and this is a, a fun thing to do. I, I initially uh, was thinking about doing it as a nonprofit organization, um, um, but that kind of fell, fell by the wayside. Uh, I used my laptop um, to record the stories. I used a webcam, and I used iMovie, and I, I kept it kind of simple because I wanted other people to realize or to understand that it wasn't difficult to do this, it something that everybody could do. And then along came uh, flip cameras and, and um, cell phones and, you know, anyone can, can talk to someone and record a story. Um, I guess what uh, Seth wanted me to talk about a little bit was how do I get people to, to tell stories and basically, um, I, like I said, I like talking to people and I started out by asking my friends, family, if they would sit down and, and uh, tell stories, you know, on, that would be online and, and, and video. And some did and some didn't. But what I, I realized over time was that um, it was kind of best if I was doing it around uh, some sort of theme or organization, uh, giving people the opportunity or, or some focus about what to tell a story about. So um, that I kind of I moved forward from there and um, had a couple stories out there on the web. And, and I was thinking that maybe I could build full stories up to the point where it would be a platform for other people to upload their stories. And I got an email one day uh, from a lady, uh, Melissa Mandel, inviting me down to uh, a, a mural project down at Six and South where they were painting a mural of uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and Engine 11. And I had done a series of... Uh, stories with uh, retired firemen from Engine 11. At one point, Engine 11 uh, from 1919, 1952 is where they sent all the black firemen in Philadelphia. And I had uh, had the stories told by five uh, firemen who, who actually worked there. And they were all in their 80s and 90s. And I said, sure, Melissa, I'll come on down. I got to talking to her and found out that they had, uh, she worked for the Histor Pennsylvania Historical Society and they had just received a large grant to build a storytelling platform. Um, built by Nike Kitchen Interactive, who was presented here before. And um, I, said, I thought, well, there goes my idea of producing my little <laughs> storytelling platform. But um, one of the things, the way in which they gather stories is that they invite people into uh, like a community center. They invite everyone from the area. They bring them in. They have them bring in photographs. And you know, they have a, a team come in. They record the stories. They uh, um, scan all the photographs, and then they go back 
and they produce the stories for, for the website. Uh, that's one way to do it. Um, and, then, and then later on I got an opportunity to uh, become involved in um, something that the Center for Digital Storytelling does uh, and the way that they produce stories uh, with uh, Lisa Nelson Haynes, who's uh, Associate Director of Paint and Bride. They do a weekend of storytelling, basically. It's almost like group, group therapy, where you come in, you sit down uh, with a group of people, and you kind of form, form your story, and you bounce it off of people, and you go back and you start writing, come back to the group, bounce it off of people. And then over a period of a weekend, um, you know, they have, you do a narration, and you do um, um, pictures. Um, so it's not a, a talking head. It's, it's an actual telling of a story through pictures and narration, which someone else was, uh, I think the gentleman from the uh, Friends uh, Service Committee was telling me that's the way they're doing their stories. Uh, I just wanted to show you briefly uh, that kind of storytelling. Um, this is the story that I did during that workshop. I won't show the whole thing, but just... Dad, tell me a story about when you were young. Chris, I can't remember any stories about myself. He laughs and says, you do have stories, you just don't feel like telling me any right now. I should tell him as much about myself as I can. After all, at 12 years old, he's the same age I was when my father died. And unfortunately, I can't remember my father telling me any stories about himself. My father was a fireman in the Philadelphia Fire Department. For the past year, I've been meeting with five retired firemen who worked with or knew my father. I meet with them to gather their stories about Engine 11. Engine 11 was located between 10th and 11th on South Street. When you joined the Philadelphia Fire Department as a black man from 1919 to 1952, you were assigned to only two places, either Engine 11 or Fireboat 2. These five gentlemen, ranging in age from 80 to 91, are the only surviving members of Engine 11. When they are gone, there would be no one left to tell their stories. Talking with my father's colleagues has given me a greater appreciation for the earth. Okay. Um, that was a lot of fun. It, it was pretty labor intensive doing that kind of story, and it wasn't exactly the kind of thing I thought I could do uh, out in the neighborhood. Um, A couple of things that I, I, I learned uh, doing this kind of stuff is that um, some of the best stories are told, or you find out some of the best stories after uh, when you're about to leave the person's house. Um, an example is uh, I met with this gentleman, Lloyd Ama, who uh, is 91 years old, and we sat down for an hour and a half talking and speaking in his living room. Uh, and I packed up everything and I'm walking out. And he said, well, you know, my last name's not Ama. And I said, what, what's your last name? He said, Amakawa. And I said, Amakawa, what's, what's that? He said, it's Japanese. My father is Japanese. My mother's African-American. And uh, I grew up in South Philly. And then he, he went back and he brought out this photo of uh, him with his brother and sister when they were young. And so I thought, God, I got to come back here <laughs> and collect this story. So I eventually did a year later. Um, another uh, lesson, um, I, I realized over a period of time that I had to really think about um, giving these people who I'm having sitting down with me a lot of respect and, and, and thinking about uh, how, am I, how I'm going to present them. I, I think initially I thought that I would just come into somebody's house and I would you know, do everything natural, and I would just do this kind of storytelling and put it up on the web. And then uh, with with Lloyd, with Ama, uh, the first time um, I did a story with him, this is this is Lloyd in his living room, and, um, you know, we we did that hour and a half I told you about. And then, you know, it was, up, it was about a year later when I went back, but, you know, his family had seen it, friends had seen it, um, I found out later that one of his sons uh, is in uh, public television in Washington, D.C. And so the next time I, I called Lloyd and I said, I want to collect a story about your father, uh, this is, um, I have to play it a little bit. This is. Well, well, how did your mother and father meet? 
my mother and father met. My mother was from from a place called Wilmington, North Carolina. She was teaching school there. She she graduated from Slater College or Institute in, in North Carolina, and she was teaching school then. Well, the summer of, I don't know what year it was, she came to Philadelphia to see her sister. That was my aunt. And my aunt and her husband, they had a had a lunch room up on Lehigh Avenue up there and the old athletics ballpark was on Lehigh Avenue at that time. And the they said a lot of the ball players used to come in my uncle's restaurant to eat. So I just do you notice the difference between how he's dressed between the first one and the second one? This is him in the first one. How much different the lighting is, you know. Um and I came I came away thinking that uh this was at when I went to pick him up at a, to go to his house to record, he came out and he said, Mike, do you mind if we go to my daughter's house? I said, No, not at all. It was over in West Philly, actually in West Philly where I did the census <laughs> years years earlier. Uh and um I said, Not at all and, and uh his his wife was there, his his daughter was there and uh we recorded the story and, and I just I, when I started editing I just noticed the difference and how he was dressed and how he looked and everything. And, I, and it just hit me that, you know, I just got to be more aware of this when, when I'm preparing people uh, for these storytelling sessions. You know, I want to present them in the best light. And then finally, um, one of the things, 75% of the people who I've sat down and done stories with have said afterwards, I feel so good after telling that story. And I didn't expect that. I didn't expect that at all. That's it. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Michael. Okay, next we're going to hear from a Zoom. Do we need to switch the video? Yeah, uh, sure. Can you just grab some more? Else? Sure. My name is, uh, again, my name is Azim Siddiqui. I'm a media educator organizer with the Media Mobilizing Project, where our slogan is, movements begin with the telling of untold stories. Nice. That is pretty nice. Yeah. <laughs> it's great on a t-shirt also. Um, <laughs> so um, I just have a question for the audience. Um, how many people out there have had trouble with access to health care? Anyone? Just raise your hands. Or know someone with trouble to access to health care? Okay. How about uh, housing? Foreclosure? Or back on pay? Okay. How many people here are happy with the current state of education uh, in the city of Philadelphia. Huh? No? All right. So, at the Media Mobilizing Project, um, we believe that there are walls of isolation between us over issues like the ones we just raised our hands or lowered our hands over. That is to say that there are folks out in rural Pennsylvania who feel they have nothing in common with someone from North Philadelphia, even though they're both facing foreclosure, both facing uh, inadequate health care, both facing a failing education system. It's being, its motivations are being shifted from, let's be real here, from educating the youth into making a few dollars more off of the youth. So. Our hope is to show that those people have more in common than they have separating them. Um, 
in the course of uh, our work, what I mean, that's a, those are lofty ideals. But in a day-to-day -day sense, what do we do? We do teach media skills, um, things like how to use a flip cam, how to use iMovie, how to use one of these bad boys. Does anyone know what this is? <laughs> Mike. Well, it's a DSLR. Okay. What does that mean? <laughs> it's a still camera that shoots HD video. Exactly. Right? HD video. Does anyone? Does anyone? Uh, has anyone seen the show House? I'm a big fan of the show House that ended this year, right? Um, one of the season finales about two years ago was shot with this same type of camera, right? The technology has made the difference. I brought this thing here. I don't know if it's going to show up. Um, and I'm sorry, I shot. What is your name, sir? And Francis, this does hide it. It does hide F as well. That's awesome. I'm sorry, I shot Francis in the face earlier with this. <laughs> Can you guys see this? Right? The little, this is the thing where. Right? <laughs> this is a desktop USB missile launcher. It's great at the office. We might believe in nonviolence, but that doesn't, you know, apply to foam darts. So I'm just going to fire one here. See if we can. Right? This whole, <laughs> yeah, this whole thing costed 36 bucks. The plastic. Right? The darts, the USB cable, however much, thank you. The programmer who programmed all this bad boy stuff was going to make the marketing. It costed 36 bucks. And, and the thing that seems to get everyone about it is that it's got this camera in it, right? It's got this thing up here that we can see that makes it something more than what it was. Cameras are everywhere. I had a presentation together. I'm, I'm going to try to stray from it a little because uh, I really like what um, Mike said. Um, we do, you know, we believe that, that that's our great advantage to try to make a difference, to try to bridge those divides, is that the technology is at a point now where it's available to everyone. And we are clever enough to do things like, you know, upload to YouTube so you can pull audio from it. Or using YouTube as a as a as a as a force of social change, right? Now, history's now got the, some legitimate examples of social media being used to affect change. And I'm going to hopefully show one from one of the groups that um, attended. We had we had a human rights conference over the weekend. Um, one of the groups that attended is organizing for Occupy, so kind of trying to harness that energy that was brought forth in the Occupy movement towards actual organizing efforts. Um, so uh, about, I guess in May, um, I taught my first digital storytelling class um, at the Head Start Learning Tree in West Philadelphia, which has, um, which has now closed um, due to lack of funding. And um, for me, the neat thing there was, I, I'm, I was born and raised in Westchester, Pennsylvania which, you know, is, is, a, is a fairly affluent area. And when I was growing up out there, the education system was, you know, on par with anyone. Um, to go into an urban environment and to have to, um, I guess the biggest obstacle we faced initially was convincing these um, mothers and grandmothers of kids in the Head Start program that they had stories worth telling Right, and um, the, this is you know this is a flip cam as, as Mike mentioned. It's a great device. Unfortunately, does anyone know the status of flip? <laughs> They're done, right? They're done. Yeah, and, and it, it is you know it is what it is because we have similar technology here. Oh, I forgot to start my timer. Anyways, um, you know we we have similar technology on cell phones, on desktop missile launchers, and and here you know. So it, it, it's just that there was something, you know, convenient about this, that you could just give it to someone, the editing software is on it, they, you know, it's not quite so intimidating. But there is this sort of nascent intimidation when it comes to technology, right? Now these were, these were this, the class was in, entirely um, women. I was the only man in the class. And um, um, they took to it. Right? Initially, there was that fear 
right? But what we have to understand is that despite the fact that this technology, where does it come from? Where does digital imaging come from? China. China. That is true. I guess that's true, right? <laughs> but what are the origins of this uh, force of social change? Much like the Internet, right? It's the Defense Department. Digital imaging came about when, um, what was it, the Cornus satellites. They were these great giant satellites the size of a bus. They had uh, usually four canisters of film. They'd shoot their roll. They'd launch it out, and um, actually there'd be mid-flight, mid-air retrieval. Um, of these film canisters, but what's the what's the problem with that? Eventually, your giant bus-sized space camera runs out of film. How do you reload it? Right. So the government went about a course to develop. I'm sorry, digital imaging, so that you can take a photo on this camera that doesn't use film, encrypt the zeros and ones that compose that photo, and transmit them down. But it's you know, it's expensive to launch a bus into space. So you make it smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, but still, you know, it, it, it's an amazing device with millions and billions of dollars of research behind it. But I still feel that um, at the end of the day, it is, is a sad, it is a sad imitation of the human eye. And most of the issues we face with technology are that you're so used to using this like natural brilliance that is your eye. And then you get, you're given this clunky device. And as user-friendly as they make it, it's easier to just use your eye, right? Most of the, what are the, for me as, a, as, a, as an instructor in um, uh, video production and digital storytelling and even to a certain extent computer literacy, um, the most common mistake I see is that people will shoot in front of a window. Right? Or they don't like to face the sun, so they face away from the sun. And you get a silhouette. Right? Because the camera's too stupid to know that you're not filming the background or what's out through the window, you're filming the subject. Right? That person is telling a story. Yet, we can look at someone standing in front of a window and see them fine. We can look at someone on a, on a sunny day and see them fine. On the audio end of things, the most common mistake I've come across is that people will do amazing interviews that tell the depths of a person's story next to an idling 18-wheeler. <laughs> right? And what do you get? <laughs> right? Or how many of us have been in a bar? Hopefully many of us. <laughs> and held a conversation with someone despite the fact that the bar is crowded. Right? The microphone on this I think a dozen of them cost $10, right? It's nothing. And it doesn't know that you're trying to listen to, you know, someone pouring their, oh, two minutes, pouring their heart out, right, instead of an idling 18 wheel. So I'm going to try to show in the little bit of time I have left, um, one of the examples that a digital storytelling student um, put together for us, her name is Ethel Funches. She's Started out, she's one of those people that started out as a student, became a friend. She's now active in Media Mobilizing Project. I encourage you all to go to mediamobilizing.org. Um, we have many ways for folks who are interested to uh, engage in the, in, the, in the movement we're trying to build here, um, which specifically, to state it, is uh, a movement to end poverty um, built by poor and working class people united across color lines. So this is by Ethel Funches. Life gets very complicated sometimes. We are all human beings who belong to the same race, the human race. But we've managed to complicate our existence with numerous ways of separating ourselves from one another. Why would one allow society to predicate one's success based on the color of their skin? Although the opportunities may be better, is it worth the separation of one from their own flesh and blood? Passing is a deception that enables a person to adopt certain roles or identities from which he or she would be barred by prevailing social standards in the absence of his or her misleading conduct. No lie is worth living with. 
so this was a story about her her mom and her aunt who were the two women depicted there and there was a, a more dated photo earlier um, and when she made this she said it was great to just get it off her chest right and it's I think that is really the power of what we are doing is that kind of to help people sort of manifest all that they can be to overcome the ills that society or that other interests have uh, implanted in them. Thank you, you Azim. So as we uh, switch the cables, we have a live. What, what, what is that? Who knows what that is? <laughs> All right, so um, these guys are uh, the kind of guys I like to hang out with and learn from, and I'm going to bring the uh, eight-year-old personality to the table today. So this is uh, sort of, I'm going to build a little bit on um, what they're talking about as to the genuine nature and talk a little bit about sort of the hooks and the, the part of storytelling that um, surprises your audience. Um, and, uh, and so you can build on what they're saying with um, some things that will help your videos to get picked up more by people who don't even know you and don't know your organization yet. Um, so there's a couple of, before I dig in here, there's a couple of um, reasons that are pretty typical for using video uh, in general online. So um, things like you know the basic stuff, um, t building team morale. It doesn't have to go viral for you to build team morale, um, for you to have fun together, for you to praise an employee who has done really well or a team member or volunteer. Um, website messaging, so having testimonials for trust. Incredibly easy. So a volunteer gives you a testimonial about how great you are or someone that you helped, Habitat for Humanity, a video of someone that you have gone out and built a home for um, or with. Uh, stories for legitimacy and supporting your goals, like if you're recruiting volunteers, you're soliciting donations. Um, Mercy for Animals does a really excellent uh, year-end summary video uh, that's worth taking a look at, um, where volunteers and team members all sort of um, talk about why they are Mercy for Animals. And it's very powerful, and it's very simple, just cut editing one to the next. Um, then, then there's the website traffic, and this is the stuff that everyone gets excited about. Um, not always, not, not necessarily more important, but everyone gets excited when I talk with them about, you know, oh, I want to get a million visits to my website, and I want to uh, have my Google rank go way up from video, and I want to show up on the first page for everything, including cars and shopping, um, <laughs> when people search on Google. So uh, there, are, there are things to do there, um, and I'll talk about that in my segment um, coming up. But right here, I just want to kind of give you some examples of uh, ways that typically video is being um, is going viral, and then some of the ways that people are actually taking it viral without the big budget. So, I'll give you a kind of these are this is Rhett and Link. Uh, they're known as the Commercial Kings. Um, they do uh, work for a combination of uh, nonprofits and more often commercial companies. Um, and I'm not getting any sound computed. <laughs> of your wedding in the spring and you're confronted by your double chin and your bald spot glistening you could get a membership at the fitness hut down the road or you could pick your mouse up and slim yourself down and even give yourself a fro your high school uh, kind of video editing quality that tends to go into a lot of the videos that go viral. Um, you don't have to do that. And in fact, a lot of people like a genuine video, something that, again, you know, you're coming from the heart. And you could even, yeah, just go and interview someone and get a real story. And, and people want to connect and want to feel, want to feel like a human again in the midst of all of the overwhelm of the internet and everything else. Even kids do. So 
um, bringing that in is is great, but uh, most of us are not going to be able to afford to, you know, get canvases um, for every single cut frame that are totally different and look like they're just being uh, photoshopped. So uh, I'm going to talk about that, but but to get up to um, some actual momentum online, it's really challenging. So you saw the introduction animation earlier. Uh, an hour of video is uploaded every second. So when you are competing online, you're, you're um, on, on video, you're competing with all the commercial companies and all the people that are just showing themselves, uh, you know, and their friends falling off the balcony and breaking their spine and then coming back three weeks later. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to keep up with that. So, um, you know, a lot of the commercial companies are spending insane amounts of money on, you know, uh, the advertising companies that do the old Spice Guy ads and everything else. And of course they go viral. Um, of course, because they, they just have an insane amount of money to just throw at it. Um, so going viral on a uh, tiny budget, um, there are a lot of things you hitch your wagon to. And, um, you know, we were talking about the 18-wheeler in the background. Uh, you can have the baby in the background or the, ki the kitten in the background um, of a video, you know, and, and just kind of interrupting you. Or um, some one of the people that I worked with for videos had... Um, trampolines that um, sometimes when he was interviewing, he, he, someone would just be bouncing on the trampoline in the background, or like he would get on the trampoline, or they'd have like some you know some crazy prop, something weird. But you'd get this video, and his his mission was to promote a plant-based diet, and he would just like interview. Oh, he has uh, right now um, a million and a, uh, one and a quarter million views on YouTube, which for someone with uh, no advertising spend. And just DIY is pretty awesome. Um, now, he has made 745 videos. He has a store where people come in and they give testimonials and, and talk about how this diet has impacted them. Um, but you can bring in little props and, and uh, you know, not to call a baby a prop, but um, <laughs> little things like this. And you can see the number of views on the bottom. Com alguns cliques, ele passa a ser somente digital. Com isso, você economiza papel e colabora com um mundo mais sustentável. So, I know you all want to keep watching, um, <laughs> but, but you know, this is something that you could just as easily, instead of using it for a paper company, which is what this is, it's like a Portuguese or Brazilian paper company. Um, you, a Portuguese, a Brazilian paper company. It's uh, you can you can hitch that to the Occupy movement and talk about humanity and what we really want for our kids in the future. Or hitch it, you know, hitch it to something that that's real and that is, uh, you know, gets to gets to your issue. So just attached to a meme. Um, or you can be creative in ways that again are low cost, but you just take a little bit of time and involve. Cancer awareness video, and um, you, you know, they got tons of views. It went on to be, you know, all kinds of other hospitals did a similar pink love dance, and uh, that's perfect. Um, and uh, and so it's it's a way to kind of again, I mean, think how think how much morale your volunteers are going to have, and how much they're going to tell their friends when you do something fun like that. Um, you know, lots of different groups do that kind of thing. You can find them all online. This is something really fun and simple. You're not just gonna walk away and give up. Stuck it. You can get that. That's yours. Nobody else. Get in there and give it some heat. Give it some heat. Get it some heat. Get it some heat. You got it. You go away from me. And you don't get it hurt. You got it. You got it. That's the one right there. You can. So, so this is. <laughs> this is for a football team, you know, they're saying cheering works, but you know, again, it's like you know, getting involved, you know, makes it happen or whatever. Um, you know, it's it's really not that hard to kind of hijack a uh, hijack a theme that you see work. Um, you know, so here's like an idea for the Occupy movement, right? You know, so like it, it doesn't take a lot of 
um, thought it just takes some fun creativity, the kind of stuff that we all have naturally. You know, we don't have necessarily uh, everything else that we need to make video. Um, and that's where, you know, these guys come in and, and lots of ways to learn that. But um, just to kind of jump ahead really quick, uh, watch kids react. Watch this. You're going to have fun watching it. It's so much fun. My sweetheart and I watch it all the time. Um, and these kids just react to viral videos, and you get a taste of humanity because we all got that kid inside of us. And that's what makes that cat funny. And that's what makes, you know, like we're reacting to something that's surprising or something that's shocking or something that's weird. Um, and Kids React is a YouTube channel, so if you search for it on YouTube, uh, you will find their channel and uh, all kinds of fun videos. Um, Kids React to viral videos! First video! I cannot nail this thing, alright. After dentist! How did it go? I didn't feel it. By the way, the ads down the bottom have nothing to do with the videos. They're just YouTube. Amazing. Yeah. Oh, I don't remember this. This is David after Dennis. Is this real life? Yeah, this is real life. <laughs> nah, uh, uh, uh. Don't this put is that a in. horrible don't little boy. Your... Why is this happening to me? It's okay, bud. Stay in your seat. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> that was hilarious. Question time. So you'll have to find out what question time is on your own time. But um, I think uh, <laughs> we're, uh, yeah, so we're just about there then. Um, so some exceptional ingredients uh, that I find really helpful for video. And yeah, if you um, write these down, I have a handout for later, but um, this is not on there. Uh, that you have a goal. So know what it is you're going after. And again, it doesn't have to be just total number of views or total number of people that decide to type in your website afterwards. Um, you know, it, it can be just about the, the cause that you're supporting and not even be about your organization's brand. Um, but have a goal and, and know what it, get an idea beforehand of what it's going to cost. Talk to someone that produces video. Talk to Azim or talk to, some, talk to Mike and Steve. Um, have a hook. So uh, I'll show you a little bit later a hook that I have for a really boring SEO video. Um, uh, keep it short, so uh, two minutes is great. Um, over two minutes, unless you're really compelling, uh, you may not keep that audience, and you may not even get to the point that you're trying to get across. You know, that pink glove video goes on a long time before you find out that it's about cancer in the first place and about raising awareness. Um, emotion, so uh, you know, bring some emotion, some shock into it, and uh, piggyback on a relevant meme, and be persistent, you know, 745 videos, you don't need to go up to that, but everyone, everyone who went viral originally on YouTube, almost always, most of them are persistent, they, they post up, so I'll show you some ways later, and these guys will too, uh, they already have, to kind of keep it simpler while you're getting started, and you can always build off of that, but get some momentum. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, I'm good to go here. Thank you, Ryan. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to take about 10 minutes for some Q&A before we go into the uh, more workshoppy type thing. So um, I, what I'd like to ask people to do is to use the microphone just, again, for the recording and the stream. Um, and if there are any comments, uh, contributions, or questions, now's a good time to start to ask them. A uh, question for Mike about um, interviewing. Your, your terrific uh, stories are to some extent an interview, whether you're starting out with just a question and the person continues to talk or you had a series of questions. But it, the, um, it, the older gentleman had about seven different tangents that he was touching on to get to the story of how his parents met. Do you have any, you know, any thoughts? Do you, do you, do you want people to get to, you know, get to a, answer a question, or do you just want to hear the story as, as, a, as I, they want to tell it? Yeah, I think initially um, I thought I was going to be like Marty Moscowine or somebody, you know, and I was going to ask all these questions, and I, I quickly realized that I wasn't very good at it, and I didn't want to be a part of the, the process that much. And you have to ask questions to get people to talk a little bit, but um, I started, what I've started doing is preparing people ahead of time. I really want a story, you know, I, and I want it to be, I, I don't really tell them length because I'll, I'll edit it, but I, I start out now just saying, you know, I, I want a story. 
um, about, and if it's about having 10 friends meeting or whatever it might be, you know, um, that's the way I go about it now. That's the way I try to go about it. And th there are certain people who just aren't very good at telling stories, and you end up asking a lot of questions and not using very much of what you, what you have. More questions? Hi, my name is Ruth Ann. Thank you all for sharing with us. Um, I have two questions. One is about one of the projects that I'm working on is very um, emotional, very hard to work on, very hard for people to face. And there is kind of a theme in society, or there has been up until Occupy, um, of the truth just makes people change the channel. Don't tell too much truth. People will just shut you off. And yet what I need to do is help people understand. It's about helping people understand each other. And it's a really hard topic. So I'm wondering if you can help me think about ways to do really, really difficult subjects and get those subjects into the common space. That was one. I got some <laughs> Um, Artists for Animals does some pretty cool stuff with uh, puppetry, and they invite people into the space. Um, and they recently did one about fracking, uh, where you know kids can come, and it's it's hard topics, but they bring a story into it that that makes it something that you can you know follow along with without being like I got to get out of here right now. Um, so that's one place to take a look. Uh, go to one of their events, maybe. Artists for animals. Okay, let's. We'll come back to you, Ruthann. Um, I appreciated everything you had to say and how you had to say it, and it's very enlightening. Um, I was wondering, though, what is it that you guys feel like you're changing through what you do? Um, I mean, is there some way that what you do um, enables, causes social change. Uh, e each of you seem kind of laid back. <laughs> and uh, I came here maybe with my own agenda, which was kind of ready to do something, change, you know, something. And uh, I'm feeling very sort of Philadelphia, laid back and kind of just easygoing. And I was wondering, like in your own heads, um, if not here, then maybe even here. Are you feeling like what you do um, through your stories and through <clears throat> just what you do um, enables or is causing any kind of change in this community here? You know, I think when I first started out, I thought that I would, uh, you know, start an intergenerational program and enable people to talk to one another within the neighborhoods and produce, you know, provide, you know, I don't know, safe place for people to be. And, and I don't, I think what, what is, um, of course I haven't done any of that, but um, I think what has come out of it um, is people just being able to uh, talk about some of the things that they've experienced over their lives. And I don't know what effect that has on other people who see it, um, there might be change as a result of that. I don't know. Um, but I just wanted to bro provide people an opportunity to tell their stories. Um, that's a laid-back approach, I know. But, you know, I, I think MMP is probably more in, in line with what kinds of things that you're talking about. Well, um, so what was your name again? Lamar. Lamar. So, um, Lamar, the group I work most closely with in uh, the Media Mobilizing Project is the Unified Taxi Workers Alliance. They were formed in 2006. Um, my ancestry is, can anyone guess where I'm from? Anyone? Call it out. Westchester. Westchester, that is true. <laughs> How about my parents? Um, yeah, I get, a, I get a lot. I was, uh, I get Saudi Arabian, I get Filipino, I get, I get black. Um, 
Native American. My, my mother and father were both born in British colonial India many, many moons ago. Um, the Unified Taxi Workers Alliance is largely Bangladeshi and West African. Um, both groups are Muslim. I'm a practicing Muslim. Um, these are guys who work seven days a week, 17 hours a day, on Friday through Monday. Um, and they pocket $25,000. They earn the medallion owners who get the money from their cabs. This layer, you, you want to talk about Philly, this layer of fat control between people working hard and getting what they should for um, their work. They earn them $200,000 for just owning a medallion. And that's per driver. Usually the cab is running essentially constantly until it runs into the ground. Repairs are paid for by the drivers. The way they term it is that we have all the disadvantages of an independent contractor and none of the benefits of an employee because they are technically um, uh, independent contractors of the cabs. They're renting the cabs. If they have a flat tire, it's a, it used to be a $350 charge for a flat tire. If they have a broken taillight, it used to be $700. Um, and that's through the, the Philadelphia Parking Authority, the PPA. Um, these guys, they're general, for, they're about 600 members strong of about a, a fleet of 3,000 cab drivers in the city of Philadelphia. Um, they recently, you know, they're, only, they're a very young union, but they recently organized enough to go to the state house and have those fines reduced so that a flat tire is $100. Now, for you and I, a flat tire is nothing. Um, I don't know that they should have to pay $100, but it's certainly a lot less than $350. Most of these guys do not speak English well. The reason that I've been assigned to that is because essentially they trust me. There is a trust issue. Right? I, I would hope that to a certain extent, that constitutes some measure of change. For those guys, it is going to be a long haul. Um, but they are, they are organizing and they are achieving tiny victories. For example, they bought their own dispatch house. The union bought it. So now if you are a, a dues paying member, you get some revenue back from that dispatch house instead of having to pay someone else for it. Um, those are the things we're doing. And I think, you know, yeah, I am a believer in the starfish theory that if you find a starfish and throw it back, it matters to that starfish. But I do believe we want to save our entire community. If you look at, um, you know, the, 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 the idea that 40 schools are being closed next year and then six for the next eight years or eight for the next six years, um, the, the Philadelphia Student Union, one of the groups that we work with, is leading the charge and knowing that they can't do it themselves, uniting with Youth United for Change um, and One Voice, which is a parent-teacher-student organization that has just formed over this issue, to try to build a coalition to affect change. So much of uh, And how are they using stories? Well, specifically, you know, if you look at students, right, how many of us, have, how many people in here have children in the Philly school system? Anyone? What are we doing? <laughs> okay. Well, that, that is pretty odd. Um, so, if if you think about it this way, that um, this idea that when I was in school, the average school, like the average classroom size was like 12, 15 people. My graduating class had. Uh, 181 students. This year, as a uh, contract that Media Mobilizing Project has with the Philadelphia School District, I had the privilege to teach at Northeast High. Um, their video production teacher retired last year, so I was there like roughly two, three days a week, teaching 30 students. Like, I'm useless, more or less, with 30 kids. Um, and the worst part for me as a teacher was you'd make a connection with the student. They'd finally understand, oh, that's what an f-stop is. And then they're gone the next three days. They're just gone. 
wherever they go, we can't follow that. You, you can't have anything close to one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but the resources are there in this country. This is the wealthiest country in the history of wealth. And yet, how really, when you think about it, how little of that wealth is being um, directed towards education as a public and necessary good, um, I would advocate, you know, I am, believe it or not, I'm with this crazy leftist organization. Of course, this is being recorded. But I'm a registered Republican. Um, yeah, believe it or not. Um, there's a national security interest in educating our young, to a certain extent. Right? And I'm not, I'm not speaking for myself. I'm speaking for the same guys who developed the Internet and these cameras. Right? They've done the studies. But beyond that, it should be a, a, a social good. That kind of change takes time. We are, we are a grant-funded organization. Um, to, to defeat the interests that want to, you know, that do the math and figure that if I make $250 per student and I've got 15,000 students in my system, right, just in one area, this the area I'm thinking of is Wilmington, right, that I can retire after two years. Okay. Revenue I generate. I'm, I'm going to just cut you off just to keep the timing going. We're going to take a break in a second, but first I just want to throw it back out to the group. If there's anyone else who wants to address that particular question, which I think is a good one that Lamar asks, which is, and we'll have more time for Q&A, and, and we will have more time for that. But I just want to throw out if anyone else has an, a response to Lamar's challenge about how storytelling, in fact, um, can cause, uh, can, can help to facilitate change. Do you want to address that? Um, I studied uh, conflict analysis and community mediation in South Africa after the transition, and I studied in Northern Ireland and in, on the Syrian-Turkish border, and the people that I was training with, working with multi-ethnic groups, couldn't use a lot of literacy programs, a lot of reading material, and they used storytelling. They also believed that every human being longs to be understood. So giving people the opportunity to tell their story gives them dignity. If nothing else, giving human beings dignity is a powerful gift. And if you can give dignity and then share it in two minutes, wow. My second thought, my second response to Lamar is if you can find amazing stories of transition, amazing stories of transformation that give hope they will go viral because people are desperate for hope. Okay. <laughs> well, that, we, all, we all have the insights to share, and that's what we want to do, and we'll continue to be able to do that. We're going to take a very short break. We're going to take a three-and-a-half-minute break until um, 7.41. Okay. For those who didn't have to leave, um, what we're going to be doing now are we'll have actually three small sections of up to 20 minutes each. The first section is actually the one that will involve the most participation from you folks, um, which is kind of a focused discussion of uh, how digital storytelling might apply to your own lives and situation. And if you have a story, you want to think about how to effectively tell it. If you have um, an idea for using digital storytelling with your organization or community, and would like to, um, you know, get the wisdom of the crowd, both the, the, the panelists here as well as other people in the, in the audience for thinking about how that can be done effectively with your organization. Or if you have an example of a video digital story that you would like to uh, show so that we can see that and comment upon it, um, we, can, we can do that as well. And Tony volunteered to actually uh, show one, which, are we ready? Yeah. Okay, so we'll start with that. Well, uh, yeah. Ready? Okay. Yeah, let me talk. Okay, talk about it for a second. <laughs> um, uh, I won't do it yet. What I, uh, what I have is, well, AFSC, which I maybe could say just a little bit about, American Friends Service Committee is an international organization, Quaker organization, based here in Philadelphia in this building. And we have work... Uh, across the United States and uh, major work in four uh, international regions in the world. And so one of the challenges is to tell the story of the work in a way 
that's compelling to the people. Our, our uh, work is supported by, primarily by individual donations. And so to tell the donors the story in a way that can be presented to them that they will actually read, watch, you know, absorb and appreciate in, in some way. So we're, we keep, we have some printed materials, we have the web, and we've um, kind of struggled with how to tell the, the story online and to figure out like what the right length of those stories is, which as every, I mean, uh, the attention span is diminishing. Uh, YouTube, uh, if you have your own channel, you can monitor uh, how long people watch your video. And so, uh, it's surprising, and it's, it's discouraging if you have a 20-minute video <laughs> to see that the people mostly watch the first two minutes, maybe three. So we've been working short. So what I want to uh, uh, ask you to participate in a little bit is we, I have two works in progress here. I'll show the second one. The first one is a kind of an overview, a minute and a half of our work in North Korea, and the second one is one we're working on right now. So the question is how much information do you need in order to care, you know, in order to be involved and so on. So is this enough? Is it too much? And, and this form we're working in is with an uh, audio interview that's then fairly highly edited and then uh, s just a f small number of still images. So if we could knock out the lights, that would probably help. I'm not sure. The audio has not been mixed, so it might be a little uneven here on this one. Oh, it's going to play the high def version. Will play well. Hmm. Here we go. Maybe. What do you think so far? <laughs> <laughs> Two minutes of waiting really creates a sense of anticipation. <laughs> Very important. Uh, I don't know why it's doing that. And I don't have any control down here to load. Oh, there, there we go. Let me see if I can. Oh. Let's try again. The, the things are the way at the end. Drag it back yeah, to the beginning. I, oh, but I thought it would start over if I did that. Did it play behind that? I don't know. I don't know if it did or not. Okay, try. Oh, wait. The, um, Do we have sound? Yeah. I can't see this. No, we don't. Yeah. No, no. For, uh, generosity, we're working, currently working on a project. Okay. <laughs> so we're working with a bunch of different groups um, on this project to get um, basically to um, promote nonprofits via video. So trying to get nonprofits to tell their story through a video and then submit it. Because we're interested in hearing the stories that you guys are trying to tell. So um, I guess a, a, a question that I have is like, what would it take for you, for, for you to submit a video? Would you, would you want to? Do you think it would be worth it? Um, we're, we're looking at different options for like prizes so it'll be kind of like in the context of a uh, a, a contest to start it to kind of kick start the process and then have a place where people can go and just continually look through videos of different nonprofits and different stories that are going on um some of i think the prizes that we're kicking around i think maybe money mostly i think volunteer opportunities so like having a business like maybe sponsor a prize for to volunteer a certain amount of hours to help your company, stuff like that. So I just wanted to get some feedback as to what people might be interested in and like if you would be interested in submitting videos to a contest that, like that. I don't know if I made that clear enough, <laughs> like what the contest is. Does that make sense? Well, the purpose is just to get people excited about the good things that are going on in the city. That's pretty much it. Well, the benefit, the, what I'm asking is, would the benefit of getting either volunteer hours or just the publicity be enough for you to submit a video? A video that we made just for that? Either one. It could be a video you made specifically for this, or it could be one that you just made in general. Uh, well, that's a, that's a good question. Would you would you want to make one just specifically for a contest, or would it have? To, would you only submit a video if it was something that you already had done? They have their goal and their mission to accomplish, and making a video may not be it. Unless you could get it shown somewhere, that would be useful and help their cause. If there was more incentive, I was just saying, if there was more incentive as far as getting the video shown, um, you know, 
where, where would you be able to get these videos shown? I, I think that, and I, I'm a little bit maybe out of touch because I didn't really read the uh, description of tonight's event before I came. But I think that when I heard the term digital storytelling, I think that there is a tremendous and immense focus on video. And I think that that focus is not limited just to this room in terms of digital storytelling. Um, but I think that we need to remember that there are other ways to tell digital, tell stories in a, in a digital manner, um, both through text and through still photography and through, you know, audio podcasts, you know, whatever. And I'm sure, you know, like we with the launch of airtime today and with Google Hangouts and the ability to tell live stories and live conversations and to, to have those, um, I think that we need to remember that video is only one component of digital storytelling. So that was just kind of a, a point of, point of uh, information. Okay. Um, yes. Well, getting back to your question, I, w I would say that why don't you do the video and you go out to the nonprofits and interview them, and then it'll be done. Um, didn't, are you familiar? Are, 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 are you familiar with TechSoup and their digital storytelling yeah. um, contest? I mean, that's huge. And um, is that what you're talking about? Something like that, with the first, second, and third place winners getting yeah. uh, tools so that they can. Uh, Sense, or it doesn't make sense. So, so I mean, this is really good feedback, just to know, because he was like, "Consensus, no." <laughs> Steve, do you have a comment? I'm going to try and make it. Um, I, you know, I, I agree with what Judah is saying about um, audio and uh, photography. There is some wonderful work in. Uh, video slideshows that was done by a great photographer who passed away a couple months ago um, who worked out of Boston, Paula Lerner. And if you go to paulalerner.com, you can see some of the work that she's done where uh, she created interviews. Uh, she would interview people in audio, and then after she created the audio interview, go back and photograph them to illustrate what they were talking about, and then create a slideshow using some of the slideshow software. Um, the other comment I would make is for folks who are thinking about doing a video, one of the things that frequently comes up when you start talking to people in the office is, um, hey, let's do a lip dub. And I don't think the world needs more lip dubs of I've got a feeling. I think the world needs you to talk about what the mission of your organization is so that people can understand what it is they're giving money to. The lip dub makes you feel good inside the organization, but it doesn't do a whole lot for getting people to give you money. Okay, any other um, questions about a specific situation you might be in before we'll, I think we're ready to try Tony's uh, video again. Um, why don't you hold off to let other people have a chance first? Um, yes, hold on. Nina. Hey, I'm Nina. I work for the Urban Nutrition Initiative, and I'm going to have 12 students over the summer that I will employ through a PYN, Philadelphia Youth Network grant. Um, they're going to be community nutrition educators in West Philly, and they're going to go around to nursing homes and rec centers and uh, elementary school daytime programs and things like that to teach kids and other community members about healthy eating, about why nutrition is important. Um, and UNI, the organization that I work for, is pretty big in Philly's food justice movement. Uh, a lot of the students want to document the work that they're going to be doing. Um, so. We were tossing around ideas, and I personally am really into podcasts, so I was trying to get students excited about audio. Um, I'm wondering how maybe how to engage students' own food stories as sort of an entry point into talking about eating, talking about nutrition, talking about health, talking about wellness. What's about that? That's a great idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think maybe having some audio interviews and what Steve was saying, maybe with some photographs as well, and, and trying to just get kids to talk about, you know, what they eat and how it makes them feel and, you know, maybe like what dinners are served at home. And I, I don't know, try to just 
see if that prompts any type of uh, feelings or emotion. And I don't know, just kind of take it from there. But I think it's a great idea. I think one of the things that would be great because you're because you're going to have the manpower is to have these kids out interviewing either their friends or the communities they're working with and asking them you know like what what do you eat and then you know looking at the statistics there and you know putting together some type of infographic about how the city of Philadelphia <coughs> eats and what you know like what your organization can do to change that or move that move the needle in the ways that you guys are intending to Um, another thing you might be able to do is you could kind of do things in stages. So with your 12 kids, you could, you know, I mean, I don't know if they're all coming equipped with smartphones at this point or not, you know, but depending, so these kids aren't going to have access to that. Can you get them to uh, try to take pictures of things that they're eating, maybe do, you know, a little bit of like, if they did food diaries for like, say, the first day that they were together, get together and talk about those, and that could looking for the things that are in common, you might be able to find what's going on amongst the kids that they could find interesting points of intersection and stories about, and then maybe with less resources in terms of like getting a hold of uh, an alternative to the flip cameras, a Kodak ZI-8 or something like that. Then you might be able to start having them on those points of interest and intersection start telling stories. Any other comments on these student stories? Within. I have two quick thoughts. One, do you know the book, Play With Your Food? I love that book. Yeah. What if you help them make like a Play With Your Food video, but somehow you would attach it to like where the food came from and like show on the map where it came from or something like that. And then the other thing I was wondering about is if you, at the beginning of the project, did a little interview, like asking what they know about their food sources or how good they are for you or whatever, and then at the end of the summer, ask them again. And maybe the, some of the kids you, or some of the people might actually have the experience of growing some food themselves, a big pot of Swiss chard or something, and talk about, this was the first time I ever grew food and ate it. I ate something growing out of dirt, you know, and I know what's in the dirt. I can tell you about the dirt. You know, something like that, where you see a before and after story. Okay, let's, let's jump to Tony's video if he promises to stop screaming. Because <laughs> I think he will. I think we found the screaming. There was a screaming video on here. <laughs> a woman screaming. Um, so the, I guess the question I, I would be interested in, in hearing, the answer I would be interested in hearing from you is, because you're probably mostly not donors to the American Friends Service Committee, like, how does it, I have some sense of how it would work for donors. So in terms of those questions of how much information is this interesting, uh, yeah, it would be useful to hear some people who work outside the our world. FSC's Agricultural Development Program in the DPRK works to introduce technologies uh, of sustainable agriculture. Since 2004, we have begun working with what we call systems of rice intensification to get the most out of each rice seed. Korea is a little far north to grow rice and has a short growing season. So while the winter wheat and barley is still in the fields, they start growing the seedlings, and then after that harvest, they transplant them. With the conventional technique, when you transplant, you have to sit in by hand, pull up all the rice seedlings and put them in the bundle, and take them out to the field. The plastic tray is a rectangular thing that you plant uh, seeds in to make seedlings that the, you then transplant. You pull out the rice seedling, it has its own little nutrient bundle, and you put one seed, uh, seedling into the ground, so you use fewer seedlings. They grow better, they're stronger, and they have a better yield. So we started talking about this in 2004, but the farm managers weren't very interested. But in 2007, AFSC took them on a, a summer tour to China to look at farm uh, technology, and they saw these plastic trays being used in China. And they said, okay, we'll try these, please send us some. 
So the first year we shipped a few plastic trays to them and they experimented on a few hectares and it discovered that it increased the yields 10 to 20 percent. So they kept asking for more trays to the point where now, if they could, they would plant all their uh, uh, hectares of rice in the plastic uh, trays. And they found that it saves equipment, it saves fertilizer, and it also saves them labor in lots of ways. So it really is a successful innovation. And it's so successful, in fact, that it was introduced at a higher level of agricultural uh, policy, and we're hoping it'll spread nationwide. So do you want to ask your question again, Tony? Well, I guess just, a, I don't want to take a lot of time, but just a, some quick reactions. So as, so one of the questions is how do you create something for donors? And, oh, stop uh, and to what extent does that reach beyond your donor base? So any, any feedback would be of interest. Yeah. It's a good documentary. That's it. Okay. You're not asking anybody to donate. You're not asking anybody to, to fund this operation. You're not doing any. You're not doing anything. Yeah, it would be in a in a context of like three or four of these. That's two and a half minutes. There would be like three or four of them that you would be uh, connected to our website that would explain the program. So yeah, the the video doesn't. That's a good point. That would be too many. Okay. One is enough. Uh, Tony, I think it's a really nice piece. Um, I do think that in terms of thinking about Quaker values and action from the tagline at the end, I'm, I'm a little, I'd be interested to learn a little bit less about the farming technique and a little bit more about the impact of the 10 to 20 percent yield gain, because to me that's the, the, the human impact of what the work is, and it's, I think, a little lost for me in the, the detail of learning about the plastic tray, though it was really interesting and well told. Okay. I think you need a classic problem solution. A compelling problem, a simple solution, and keep it shorter. It's interesting, but to get something done, you need to, I think, flip it around. Wait, I, I'm not trying to, I understand, you, you need? You, you need a unique uh, problem up front. What are you trying to uh, do? Okay. It works. There's a solution, but make it a little more compelling than just, here's the problem, here's the solution create some words that set it up, or a title card, but something that makes makes it pretty dynamic. Okay. Okay, just a couple of people haven't spoken so far, and we'll be wrapping this part up. Uh, I think it might be, be useful to put it in a, a little bit more context about North Korea, because we think of North Korea as just a, a, a really dark hole with nothing positive there going on at all. Um, and I think of North Korea and I think of famine and somehow famine or lack of food wasn't mentioned at all and that seems like that's, that's the problem this, um, famine as well as uh, extreme repression um, and a question that is, is raised in my mind is okay so you're supplying these plastic trays are the plastic trays reused plastic is also relying on oil it's a, a, a fossil fuel based uh, thing, can North Korea develop the ability to create the plastic trays themselves? So it raises questions in my mind about the, the feasibility of these plastic trays. So plastic is not a positive word. No, it's not. One more comment from someone who hasn't spoken yet. So, um, two. Can you be quick? Yeah, I felt like I was listening to a uh, commentary about a story. I wanted to hear from the people in the still shots uh, because there's a, for me there's a trust factor when somebody's commentating on a first-hand story rather than hearing the first-hand story from the people who have their, their hands on it. All right. It's hard in that one, context. One more quick comment. I hear you. I, I understand. We're not actually uh, in contact with the with the people directly in, in North Korea, but yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree with the last two points completely. Um, I think that in, you may do better with a more wholesome and rounded 
uh, <coughs> viewpoint because it was really one-sided. We heard from the lady from AFS, uh, AFSC, uh -huh. and that was pretty much it. And also, on the point about plastic, even if you just said these plastic trays are being reused instead of just dis discarded, um, I think that would give people a better feeling about you using plastic, because right now, plastic is almost a curse word in many circles. Um, so I think a more wholesome, rounded approach to the story and more view viewpoints would help. Okay. Thank you. Okay, now we know we can go. Thank you very much, Tony, for showing that for us. I know we can go much longer with these sorts of stories about people's own situations. And as was mentioned by someone during the break, that, you know, that could be its own session and perhaps it will be at some point. But we're going to move forward at this point. And Azim is going to show us um, some information about actually editing uh, one of these things. So, guys, just in case, I'm, I'm just going to move on to the Apple system. Um, there's a program, it's bundled for those of us who have PCs. Uh, I didn't use the PC in a while, except for on a Mac. Um, it's called the Windows Live Movie Maker. It does pretty much everything. That's a weird it's, it does, you know, iMovie and uh, Windows Live Movie Maker. Now that is live to their title. Um, do pretty much the same thing. They're sort of like a, a, a watered-down version of like a higher end editing system. Some people say it's more user friendly. Honestly, for my my take on it, having taught it now to high school kids, is that it's purposefully uh, limited. So to overcome your frustrations, you just drop the 300 bucks and buy the, the full brand. Um, for, so for digital storytelling, how many people out here have, have used a, a nonlinear editor? Okay. Wow. So that's so a non-linear editor would be as opposed to a linear editing system. Like you know, they, they we talk about cutting film, we talk about shooting film, all these terms that like at one point literally people did shoot film. Uh, the French guy uh, Etienne Jean Marie, who developed the photographic gun. That he was a physiologist. He took 12 photos in a second. He was studying motion, right? That's where we get the term shoot from. Cutting film was literally, you know, that there used to be a dude out there with a, uh, a small sort of flatbed that film would be sprocketed in. And he'd have a little razor blade initially, then they turned it into like a tiny paper cutter like arm. And they'd literally splice the film. And that was very much a linear process, although some. Film geeks say no, it was nonlinear because you could just cut it on both ends and make it sand. But the idea that sort of like a typewriter versus a word processing program, right? Like you start at the beginning, you cut through the beginning to the middle, and you get to the end. A very A to B to C, all the way down to Z linear process. Whereas on a word processing program, you, you want to work on the middle, you can work on the middle. You think you got the ending, you got the ending. It's the same sort of thing with editing. You can edit any scene you want, um, and then marry all that stuff together. You know, sometimes on, on big budget films, um, the effects work starts months in advance because it takes so long, right? So, you know, a friend who's out in Hollywood, who Mike and I went to sleep with, Bill Eckert, right now he's cutting the next Smurfs movie, so you have that to look forward to. Even though, like, you know, there's the idea that the trailer is being done before the movie is being done. He's working on the trailer. It's all, you know, it's all little dancing blobs. And but they still have to go out and shoot the actual stuff that these tiny blue blobs will dance on. Um, it allows for that because certain things take longer than others. It's just a more free system. So a non-linear editor or an NLE allows for you to, much in the way of 
word processor we have somewhere there. We can edit what you'd like. Questions? I'm going to take that. <laughs> so, that being said, the the big drawback for me, um, and yeah, I guess, uh, is it Judah? Judah mentioned digital storytelling is bigger and better than just photos and um, and some kind of voiceover. Um, that, that unfortunately, is the only part of it I know. I guess I take photos from my organization as well, but we don't really string them together as slideshows. There's, um, as I mentioned, there's a, a slideshow. No, that's not it. That's a dog. Um, but hopefully we'll get to... It's just, it's very powerful. Maybe we'll watch it real quick. This is, you know, another kind of, uh, so this would be sort of a finished digital storytelling piece. It's by organizing for Occupy. It's, you know, it is very moving, so we'll watch the dog eating Cheetos after. Mr. Hall to me, all the people here, we're asking you to hold all the sales right now. We're going to survive, but we don't know how. Mr. Auctioneer, all the people here, we're asking you to hold all your sales right now. We're going to survive, but we don't know how. Mr. Auctioneer, all the people here, we're asking you to hold all your sales right now. We're going to survive, but we don't know how. Mr. Auctioneer, all the people here. So that's a, a song that the group sings at actual foreclosure auctions to shut them down. And it has, to a certain extent, gone viral. So people, it started in Brooklyn like many things, and, yeah. and, and so folks out in San Francisco are doing the same thing. The woman that we saw in it, that we got a brief glimpse of, um, it was an 82-year-old woman who bought her house for $500 50 years ago uh, to help a uh, family member going through a custody issue. Uh, she got a, essentially a predatory loan for quick cash. And, she was going to get evicted. 82 years old, she was going to get evicted. And that's one instance that uh, they were able to stop that foreclosure proceeding. Now, because it is so powerful, we're just going to watch it dog eating Cheetos. This is the other thing you can use it for, too, right? Not much editing here, just the fade. But great audio. <laughs> of course he does. <laughs> okay. Now I can continue. Okay. So, so digital storytelling for the way I, you know, I've been kind of tasked with it is someone records a narration on a device. Um, I, uh, I interviewed uh, my supervisor, even though he's eight years younger than me in break dances. Brian Mercer, he was here earlier, but he left. On a, a flip cam, because flip cam's got amazing sort of software in it to isolate audio. Uh, we interviewed it out on the steps of our facility in West Philadelphia <coughs> on Chestnut Street. This is the audio we came up with. Um, I'll just play part of it just to demonstrate what it's like to edit within GarageBand. You can see my work, I think, is... So the, the, best part of the best part of my work, I think, is being able to connect with um, so many amazing, amazing people. The reason I'm using GarageBand is that Unfortunately, both iMovie and Windows Live Movie Maker only allow for two tracks of audio, and that is, and that is to say some kind of musical track and the audio linked to the actual video. Um, the digital storytelling is very sort of audio dependent in this form. Um, so most of the time we have someone record audio first and then we bring it in. When you bring an isolated audio track into iMovie, um, and I'm just going to pull up on movie. There we go. Um, if I was to import in... Spinning. If I was to import in... So, so this background green, as you can see, um, is the actual audio track. OK. 
Okay. Um, I'm just going to quickly open a new project to show you the issue I'm talking about. File new project. How are we doing on time? Two minutes left. Good God. Okay. So this window is where your editing happens. This is where your sort of overall library of footage is. Um, if you can also drag and drop in, which is what I'm going to do. So I opened up Finder. If we're familiar with um, uh, Mac systems, this is the way you access your footage. I go to the desktop. I'm going to find, yeah, I'm a fan of True Blood, sorry. Um, here is the audio I edited in GarageBand. If I drop it in, it doesn't exist. It's photo dependent. You have to import in photos. And the, so each photo has a duration. So going back to the, um, the project I just had open, um, you can see that the green only exists where the photos are. Now he spoke for a minute. For that minute, or a minute and a half, for that minute and a half to exist, I have to add all these photos. Just, just so we have all of his audio, I'm going to take this last photo. Right? If you go to this, this um, drop-down menu, this little gear, you can go to Clip Adjustments and adjust the clip length. So I'm just going to adjust it to 25 seconds so we have most of his audio. And to also demonstrate how duration works. So it looks like nothing happened. Right? Most nonlinear editors work at a, like the, the sort of paradigm is that the, this playhead, this red bar, moves at a constant rate. This is one of the frustrating things about iMovie. It adjusts the speed of the, the red bar. So you can see it's moving, moving, moving. This last one is significantly longer. Suddenly it slows down. That's the only indication you have of the duration of this last photo. Um, just as useful tips, um, over here is sort of your access to your library. Um, this sort of like uh, four triangles forming a square are your, um, your transitions. The most commonly used transition is the cross dissolve. You just drag and drop like so many other things. Um, and now we can go from, so it's like a slow, page, uh, slow fade. If you double click on the little symbol that is a pull, uh, the icon, you can adjust the duration again. Um, so if you have photos, you can drag them in. I'm going to go to this little camera to show the photos. Okay. My photo. Oh, sorry, goodness. Um, I'll go back to photo booth. We're going to use this spiral symbol of mine. You can just drag it in and drop it right, from your library. Uh, and again, you can adjust many things. You can adjust the video qualities of it. In the, in the beginning of this, one thing, like, uh, um, you know, this guy, he did not invent it, but he gets all the credit for it. So my name is you see uh, that, Brian Yeah, Mercer. you see that slow pan and, up Brian, um, and then down into the medium of the project sign. The way Apple officially <laughs> refers to that is Ken Burns. Uh, all of the effects on it are indicated by tiny icons, so if you can see that right there in the upper left of this square, if you double click on the square, um, it selects it. You can then adjust the um, Ken Burns cropping and rotation that opens up in your viewer here. And all it is is two rectangles. The green is the start, so if we wanted to go really crazy, we could start just on um, little Sarabella up there. Right, and then expand out to everyone. And essentially between what you start and stop with and the duration, that's your, that's your effect. And, and um, I work with uh, Media Mobilizing Over 10 Project. Seconds, you've got this sort of slow fade uh, and little Media Mobilizing Project was... If we were to again go in and say, okay, that's too slow, and we do a clip adjustment, we're gonna make this really edgy. We're going to bring it down to one, one crazy second. And um, I work with the uh, yeah. Media Mobilizing Project. Uh. Okay. So I, I would say this. Yeah, there are tutorials on, online. If you like to learn with a teacher in front of you, um, we do have media institutes pretty frequently. The, there are other places throughout the city that teach iMovie and, and editing software as well. Um, and you can always buy a book. Questions in the 30 seconds we have left?
Thanks very much. And obviously, we can't go through all the details of, of this. And as Azim mentioned, there are places around town to learn this sort of stuff. I think that Phillycam also has classes for this sort of thing, and maybe Scribe Video. So um, there are other source, sources to kind of get into this in greater depth. There's obviously a lot of depth in there yeah. to, to learn. Um, and again, maybe I didn't say this. GarageBand is the audio editing kind of thing. I mean, it was kind of the mix of the day. Okay. Well, thank you, Azim. Mm -hmm. Pressing right ahead, we're going to um, have about 15 minutes for Ryan to talk about once you've gotten the product, what you can do with it. And um, if everyone uh, can pass around those, uh, there's some just handouts that give you access to a couple of things that I mentioned tonight. Um, so, yeah, there we go. Cool. Um, so just really briefly, this shrinks it up so that I can't even see uh, what I'm talking about. First of all, real quick, um, I think Lamar had mentioned, you know, like how uh, how are we um, actually making a difference? Uh, I think one of the best ways is you just learn from each other. And it does, definitely does make a difference if you reach people. And if you don't, then you just wasted a lot of donors' money that could have gone to something else useful. So that's one of the reasons that it's helpful to have some goals. This kind of thing where you share information that you already know is really helpful. This is a great book. Uh, definitely recommend it about um, connecting with people in any movement. It's not specific to uh, the author's movement. Um, this is another uh, very cool tool. Uh, if you want to kind of hack uh, before you get to the point of uh, having GarageBand or Windows 7 and really getting into that, um, and you just want to make a quick presentation uh, slideshow, I actually use this tool. It's $12 a year um, called screencast-o-matic.com. And um, this allows you to uh, literally just start recording. You have your PowerPoint slides up or whatever else on your desktop. Uh, and it's very straightforward, very simple. You can learn it in a matter of half an hour. Um, gives you a quick starting point. Um, when you are uh, midway through, you can kind of edit and truncate the certain positions um, in order to go back and you decide where you want to start over without having to do the whole thing over from scratch. Um, there are some examples that you can see on uh, my website's uh, videos that I've made with that. I don't really want to talk about that um, right now because if you can do it, um, what is Ames bringing up is a much better uh, method. Um, let's see here. So, I'll be back. So, um, let's talk about here we go. Uh, the choosing your keywords. Um, so, does everyone know that? Uh, I'll just explain what keywords are. Keywords are the things that people use to search for your videos, search for your website. It's actually keywords just means how do people actually think, uh, what words do people use when they think about you and what it is they're looking for. So um, one of the things that really helps with finding the right keywords to use when you're putting your videos online, uh, go to Reddit and just search for something relevant to you. So here's fracking. Um, the thing that I love about Reddit is you get to see what people are saying they are interested in. So that's this number right here. Uh, you get to see how many people are commenting on it, which is this thing right here, and then you get to see how long ago it was submitted. And so you can find some really cool stuff. You know, you can see um, on fracking, uh, stuff about um, Halliburton is really getting pushed up. Uh, under Occupy, um, stuff about the Marines and the Oakland Police. Um, you can kind of go through, and I just brought up a couple of different examples. Um, I'm not really going to spend time on here. But uh, check it out. There's a link to it on that spreadsheet, or on the uh, paper that got handed out. Um, does that make sense to everyone? I, I'm trying to breeze through because there's a lot to cover. Does anyone have any questions about that? Okay. Um, and, and again, that's kind of like some of the languaging you use in the video that you create. This tool is called Suple.com. So um, here, you actually get to see what the most searched queries are on YouTube. So you go to Suple.com, and you actually get to see it across all kinds of different search engines, even including Amazon and Wikipedia. But Google too. Um, and you get to see, okay, so what are people searching for on YouTube? If you want to make a video about fracking, but you use the language that no one's searching for, you're not really going to get a lot of pickup there, and it's going to be entirely based on your own network and how they spread it around. So um, that's that's a really great tool to use. Uh, the um, places that you use your keywords. So if someone searches here um, on YouTube 
for cancer, uh, leukemia. They didn't put the word survivors in here, um, which is surprising to me. So their video actually didn't come up. I was trying to find it, and I searched for cancer survivor uh, music video. Couldn't find it. It's this video got two million views. Kelly Clarkson promoted it. Um, everything else, and it's just people uh, lip syncing to Kelly Clarkson's Survivor song, who have had cancer and survived it, and are her stronger song. Um, and it looks really depressing at first, but it gets better. It's sort of like the problem solution thing that this gentleman brought up um, over here. Uh, so your keywords will get used. You'll, I'll show you exactly where we use those in a second. Um, so one quick point that is really important: um, everyone in Pretty much companies, nonprofits, everyone that I talk to always wants to do videos on their own, promote their own things, do every project on their within their own group, right? Um, and the more you can go out and, and take the time that you would have been spending trying to figure out how to market your video before you even get to market it, you can take just that time and go out and find a, find a partner, not a corporate partner in this case, find a, a partner that's someone like Kelly, Kelly Clarkson or someone who cares about what you're doing in the case of cancer. There are so many celebrities that have children that have had cancer or have had cancer themselves. Um, I know I'm talking really fast, so feel free to tell me to slow down if you want to. Um, I think we got about 10 minutes. Is that about right, Seth? Just um, pretty close to 10 minutes. Yeah. So uh, that is something that um, you can do really well using, uh, not Kids React, using LinkedIn. Um, so if you have a LinkedIn account, um, you are connected to certain people. Those people are connected to certain people through LinkedIn. And those people are connected to certain people. So if I look at my network, I actually have somewhere around like 4 million people that I can reach out to for an introduction. Um, because of the, it's the Kevin Bacon six degrees of separation and we all know each other through at least maximum six people, um, you can reach out to. So you can see here, I just looked up nonprofits Philadelphia. So if you're generosity, and you're reaching out to um, nonprofits in the Philadelphia area, just type that in in the advanced search. So the search is up here, and when you search, you can make it more advanced on the left hand side. A whole ton of nonprofits will come up. Um, and so in this case, I'm searching for nonprofits. Other cases, you'll search for celebrities. And you can see that I have a friend who is connected to uh, someone who works at um, uh, Big Brother, Big Sister Network. Um, you know, actually a couple of people. So I'm, con I'm connected uh, by secondary connections to five different people, including the VP of Marketing and Communications. So um, it's really uh, a powerful tool. And if you don't personally have those, again, your whole team, your volunteers, someone has a parent or a friend who knows that person that you want to get, and you have a couple of people reach out to them, um, it's a pretty cool tool. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but when you look at someone, just really quickly, here, um, right hand side it says connect. Um, this guy has uh, an open link network. Usually um, you're not going to just be able to connect and instantly be connected to them. And even if you do, it doesn't mean a lot because he's getting connected to from a whole ton of people. But this person, if you scroll down on the right hand side, Janet Kenny knows Alexis Sevilla. So I can um, ask for an introduction right here. There's a link there that says get introduced through a connection. I have reached out to the craziest people. You know, a guy sold his company for $100 million. I reached out to him. Next day at the conference, he recognized me. Wow. I just sent him a, I just sent him an unsolicited um, uh, comment through LinkedIn. It's not like email. You get a, you might get a contact every couple of days um, versus 500 emails a day for some of these guys. Yeah, one thing there to getting recognized, um, you have your picture. Really yes. Helps. Yeah, having your picture is important. Again, as much context as you can put in. Uh, or not again, but that's a great point. Um, and uh, let me scroll through Kelly Clarkson. Google Docs. Google Docs, I have this on the spreadsheet here. Um, very, you, you can just upload your video to Google Docs. All it is is you go to a G, open a Gmail account. Um, there's a way to, it shows you how to do this on the, on the site, but you can click on um, up at the top uh, when you're in Gmail. You click on the Documents tab um, right up there, and that will bring this up. Uh, it won't have all these files, but you can add your own just by clicking this link. You click on that, add a file from your desktop. This is a video I added. So I added this video. Now when I click on this video, I can view it in my, um, hang on a second here. Yeah, so I can view it right inside of Google Docs, but I can also embed it on my website. So there's two things that you should be doing with your videos. One is get them up on YouTube and get them up on Vimeo. 
Um, but, I mean, you don't have to worry about everything. YouTube is the one that I always go to. Um, don't get too caught up in every video network. YouTube has this insane lion's share of video searches. Um, and so right here, you click on embed this video, and whoever does your website can just copy and paste this code right in. You can even email it to them and just have them do it. Done. Now you have a video right on your website. Um, so that's, that's really helpful for hosting those videos. It makes it a lot simpler than trying to have complex plugins. Um, and I won't show you how you embed them on your own website. Um, that's different for each person's website. I'll up on YouTube here. We are, so I clicked on upload in my account. Um, I don't really use this account for uploading videos. I use it for watching uh, Kids React. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I put in, um, this is this is the most boring thing in the world, SEO directories and how they help your, your website SEO and all that stuff, right? It's um, very boring. Uh, I just decided to put in Google Things for Sexy. Um, not a great title, I just wrote it on the spot right here, but, but something that's a little bit different than SEO directories uploading. You know, something something that's totally boring. And then a, a quick tagline that explains what I'm doing. And I mentioned some of the keywords that I decided to use. Inter internet directories, um, search engine optimization. Uh, again, I use, I use Suvel to, to learn that on Google or on YouTube, people aren't really searching for SEO. They're searching for search engine optimization. So again, figuring out the right keywords is important. Um, and then down here, you just write in some words uh, that are relevant that you expect people to be searching for. So. Uh, directories, I mean, I put in some random ones here, uh, and then sometimes people tend to like it if you throw in like a little phrase at the end of your keywords to kind of hack the system. Um, so you don't need to do that, but, but put in somewhere around, um, you know, like 10 to 20 keywords that you think are relevant that people are going to search for your video on. And you can look, um, always look at the competition um, and, and other people that are not competitors but possible allies, see what they're doing. Five minutes, perfect. Um, so then you can scroll down. Uh, you've really got the basic stuff in here. If you click on advanced settings on YouTube, um, you can basically, I always allow all comments, but you can set it to only approve, only allow approved comments, which is especially important if you're using, for example, sensitive stories and you don't want uh, image like kids <laughs> commenting on them um, without it getting approved. And uh, you don't necessarily have to worry about your location uh, and all of this extra stuff. It's pretty pretty straightforward to add a video. They put a lot of work into the user experience. Um, when you do that, save it, and up it goes. Now, here we are. So I just did this while I was sitting here earlier, and uh, now um, we've got this Google Things for Sexy video up here. Um, and uh, now I can go about the, the point of promoting and uh, getting that out there to my network um, on this on this sheet, so everyone has this sheet. Um, there's a group in the city called Tech Girls, really awesome group, works on helping girls understand that, hey, you don't just have to sit at home and sew. You can do that if you want to, but if you prefer to, you know, um, do anything else, if you want to be a different kind of parent, if you want to go out and, and have a corporate job in the tech world, it's all up to you, and there's no limitations. Um, so it's sort of reversing that, that uh, historical aspect where we've kind of pushed women to the side. Um, reached out on, on their behalf to my network and just said on here, you know, hi friends, I'm reaching out to ask for help. I gave it the subject line of can you help 15 seconds is all it takes. And I asked them to forward it to their friends. I asked them to post um, up on Twitter and asked them to to, um, uh, to go and rate it and comment on it. Um, this was about a story that they got listed on, so an article. And again, um, to the gentleman's point before, uh, you know, really this applies across the board. It's not just one place. But we're talking about video tonight, so um, you can use this uh, for your video. You're, people want to support nonprofits. It's easy, it's easy, but you've got to give them the material. So um, the gentleman back here said, you know, you've got to have an, a, an ask or, or a statement of what it is you want the person to do, because they're not going to assume it on their own. They get hit so many times with calls to action, so you got to give them one yourself. That's not, you know, in their face, but lets them know, hey, here's how you can help and why. Um, and then uh, if you are looking for something creative and you can't come up with any good ideas, uh, Fiverr.com, F-I-V-E-R-R.com is a lot of fun both for the people that, that uh, provide services on there and the people that uh, use it. So um, what could I possibly need a girl dressed in peas for me uh, to do for me? Um, I mean, I couldn't think of a good answer until I saw this video. Peas by Jim's new book. Anne Marie, will you peas go to prom with Terry Ray? Okay, 
okay, these are super cheesy and, and awful, and you can be more creative. You just tell her what it is that you'd like her to do. So, you know, you're a veggie organization, and you want her to dance around in a pea suit and hold up a sign that says whatever you are. Um, you can do that, or nutrition, or whatever else, right? Um, $5. Everything on Fiverr is $5, and you can, they add some extra services for $10, but it's really easy to sort through and find something fun. We sent our clients um, uh, video songs for the holidays, that talked specifically about them. We just got an artist to, for $5 each song. Um, he had to, had his own chords, and he used our lyrics. Uh, or we actually just told him about the people, and he wrote the lyrics. I think it was like an extra 10 bucks a client. And it's like, all right, that's fun. That would have taken me a couple you know, thousand dollars to do a different song for each person, or a lot of my time anyway. I don't know guitar very well. So, um, yeah, that's, that's uh, kind of a fun closer. Um, so much more to talk about, but... Uh, Really quick, um, I do also, uh, I'm doing this as a living and showing people how to do their own internet marketing. For nonprofits, we really want to essentially give this away. It costs me $2.50 per person that uses a video training program that we have. So if anyone wants to use that video training program for $2.50 a month, you're welcome to it. Just let me know. Um, we're building that out now. But uh, if you have any questions that are unrelated, just give me a call anytime. Thank you, Ryan. We did run a little bit later than we expected to um, uh, for the duration of this this call, so th this session. So um, I think we're going to kind of wrap it up at this point. Um, people can stick around; they can ask questions of each other or the folks on the panel. If anybody wants to stick around a little bit longer and go out for a bite and a drink, they're welcome to while we break down. And I just want to thank the entire panel as well as everyone who came for doing what they did. <laughs> A quick announcement from Francis. The Interfaith Working Group is having a workshop about storytelling, about learning to evoke stories from people, and it's 1.30 to 5 o'clock on June 24th in this room. So um, AFSC is helping us with this, so um, you might call there if you have other questions, or you can, I have an outline of kind of, the man who was here earlier about storytelling, he's the one who's leading the workshop. But it's more about evoking the stories, our ways to evoke stories. Okay. Thank you very much.